but causality itself is not a, an observable feature of the world. That's the name we give when we see a relationship between things. Okay, welcome back to Act Root to Fruit. My name is Marcel Tassara, and I am uh, having some fun here, working my way through the contextual behavioral forest to, to understand uh, the roots and, and to, to get to know the roots of the contextual behavioral psychologies like ACT and FAP and um, compassion-focused therapy and... And so, so I've been I've been meeting with different guides, and today I'm really really excited to have uh, a seminal player in this in this uh, in this area. I'm, I'm meeting today with Dr. Linda Hayes, who's a distinguished professor at uh, University of Nevada at Reno, uh, who over the course of her career has contributed greatly to behavioral theory and philosophy. She's a fellow in the Association for Behavior Analysis International, and I would say one of the tap roots for this this thing we call ACT and the contextual behavioral sciences. Her attention to the philosophy of science has functioned as a kind of an officiant in the in the marriage between functional contextualism and, and interbehaviorism, Cantor, and uh, the contextual behavioral sciences. So, so I, I I'm really really grateful for you to to share your precious time with me, Linda. Thank you. You're welcome. I guess I'd like to kind of start with like what, from your perspective, how do you sim- put simply or in layman's terms what rule governance is? Well, it's um, it's a complicated uh, issue, actually. Uh, I became interested in it because I didn't think that Skinner's analysis of rule governance uh, made sense. Okay. Uh, essentially, what Skinner had said about it was that um, rule governed behavior differed from contingency shaped behavior uh, in that it was not uh, immediately reinforced. Okay. So it was, but it was nonetheless under the control of a prior verbal stimulus in the form of a rule. Yeah. yeah. Under these conditions, do that and something good will happen or not. But in other words, it wasn't reinforced, but reinforcement is the process that brings about uh, uh, discriminative control by stimuli. Mm-hmm. So if rule governing behavior wasn't reinforced, how did it then come under the discriminative control of prior verbal stimuli? So, mm-hmm. you know, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> uh, he might have said um, rule governing behavior is an operant like any other operant. Topography doesn't really matter as long as under these conditions you engage in some behavior and it's reinforced in this way. He didn't say that. Real quickly, just for a definition mm-hmm. point, what do you when you say operant, what does that mean? An operant's a class of behavior. Okay. The membership in that class is defined by uh, the conditions under which it occurs, the uh, antecedent conditions, but also primarily the reinforcement conditions. Okay. So. If, I, if, if it would be reinforcing to um, get through the door, I can engage in a number of behaviors that might have that outcome. Yeah. I could knock on the door. I could ring the doorbell. I could tear down the door. You know, uh, I could do a number of things that would have the, the outcome of getting through the door, which would be the reinforcement for that activity. Mm-hmm. All of those behaviors, even though they aren't uh, topographically similar to one another, by virtue of the fact that they occur in the presence of a closed door and they result in the door being opened are members of an operant class. Okay. Class membership is defined by the conditions. So, so when, when anybody listening hears the word operant, it's kind of shorthand for all of that and operant, operant behavior really. Yeah. Okay. So rule governed behavior is, um, uh, according to the principles of behavior analysis, um, you, you can't have behavior occurring under the control of discriminative stimuli unless those stimuli have been established as discriminative stimuli by reinforcement. But rule governed behavior is defined as behavior that doesn't, uh, is, is not immediately reinforced by Skinner. Okay. But the second problem, so, so that's, that's a problem with the, um, it, the uh, definition of terms and the, it, it's a problem of inconsistency is what mm-hmm. that problem is. Mm-hmm. But the other problem or the, the difficulty with the rule governed behavior is that 
you know, uh, when the bell rings, take the cake out of an oven. So there's the description of the contingency. Uh, so th those are all sounds, you know, as stimuli. They're auditory. It's an auditory stimulus. And, you know, some time later, the bell rings. It's not an auditory stimulus. And you engage in some behavior and something happens. But it doesn't match the auditory stimulus. In other words, if I said, when the bell rings, take the cake out of the oven, if I said that in French and you don't understand French, mm -hmm. then there's no chance that later when the bell rings, you're going to do anything at all. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Other than hear the bell. Mm -hmm. So um, so what had to be analyzed is how do you, you know, how does a verbal stimulus contingency description, how do you get from there to acting in the presence of the things mentioned in the verbal stimulus? So in mm -hmm. other words, there needed to be an analysis of the behavior of the listener. And the listener has to be able to, when hear the words, uh, when the bell rings, the listener has to in some way hear a bell upon, upon being told that. Mm -hmm. The cake, they must they must know what a cake is. They must be able to see a cake or smell a cake or think of cake or or something, you know. Or yeah. that uh, the the you know, the cake will burn. Well, they must know what burning is. In other words, they must be able to react to that verbal stimulus in more than just hearing it. There has to be actions with respect to the things that those words refer to. Okay. And Skinner doesn't really make an analysis of um uh, of the listener's behavior other than to say that the listener's uh, role is to mediate reinforcement for the speaker's behavior. Uh -huh. So the sort of uh, the case of interverbal behavior is doesn't is inconsistent with the other with principles of behavior from Skinner's standpoint. And even if it wasn't, uh, there's no explanation for how the listener gets from hearing the rule to engaging in certain behavior. And so um, I just felt like that analysis had to be, you know, it had there had to be a critique of that, and yeah. there had to be. Um, and I think one of the things that that Skinner uh, overlooked is the operant is talking about a class of behavior. Okay, mm -hmm. saying that this stuff has never occurred before. Rule governed behavior happens just at once because once it's reinforced, then it's contingency shaped behavior. You know? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it ha it, it, rule governing behavior is something that happens once. It, it, it happens without reinforcement and contingency shape. The cake's, the cake's ready. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think what he did wrong is he compared a case of, um, you know, a, a case of a contingency shaped operant with an individual instance of rule governed behavior. Okay. Well, you can't really do that. And okay. so, and, yes. And where, where, where are you now with this? Have, I mean, well, have, you know, I, I wrote a paper about this in, um, in 80, 1983 called um, B.F. Skinner, colon, Consensus and Controversy. Okay. And there were a number of different topics, and one person wrote what Skinner had to say, and some person critiqued it. And okay. so that's where that critique appeared. But I, I didn't really. Um, you know, I, I think of rule governance now as um, as involving what uh, Cantor calls, what I call, uh, substitute stimulation. Uh, in other words, the response, uh, when you hear the bell, you're also hearing the bell when that's mm -hmm. said. Uh, and if you can't hear the bell when somebody says, uh, when you hear the bell, you can't do anything when the bell rings. You know, you're, you you can't get from that verbal phrase to actually acting in the presence of a completely different stimulus at a later mm -hmm. time. In other words, the bell, as opposed yeah. to the sound of the bell, okay. as opposed to the word bell. Okay. So I think of it as substitute stimulation. Stimuli have multiple pr stimulational properties. And um, hearing the bell upon being told something about the bell is a substitute stimulus of that verbal behavior. Okay. I, RFT talks about it in terms of um, 
implicit responding, substitution, multiple stimulus functions, things of that sort. Okay. Does that and, make and sense? Yeah, it does. And I'm wondering about like what your, uh, I mean, your, your work is, is uh, integral to the, the beginnings of, of RFT. Yeah. Uh, how are you seeing that progression over the last few decades? Well, um, I think there's been certainly an awful lot of work done and um, a lot of research and there's been a lot of um, activity and progress and yeah. all of that. Um, yeah. But, um, you know, I, I, I think RFT is still kind of Skinnerian hmm. and um, the, 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 the concept of the operant is there and the concept of the operant is a causal uh, is is a um causal category yeah yeah and uh i don't think that way so um i think there's What's problematic been... about that for you causality yeah oh, well. i know that and i know i mean I, i'm interested because i know that the the interbehavioral cantarian view is different but i don't i don't fully understand it well, um, we often talk about, you know, we talk about, you know, one stimulus causing a response, and we talk about the reinforcement forcing stimulus of being the ultimate cause of behavior. Mm-hmm. In other words, that one thing does something, makes something happen to something else. And that, that part about the make something happen is an inference. Hmm. We see that this is related to that, uh, but the notion that one thing has power over the other and makes hmm. something happen, I think, is a um, is no longer an, a, a, a. I think it's not a contemporary way of looking at relations among things. I think it comes from older linear notions of causality and, and mechani- mechanistic kind of. Thinking. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so I, 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 that doesn't seem to me. It's not as though we can't do experiments and put, you know, an animal in a chamber and manipulate something and see what happens. And we can talk about um, we can talk about uh, relationships uh, in that context as um, um, I wouldn't use the word cause, but we can talk about independent and dependent variables. And meaning that, I mean, all experimentation is the same. Um, You, you know, you have some circumstance, you manipulate something, you see what happens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people sort of uh, criticize interbehaviorism for not having an experimental branch. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's... uh, it's the same experimental branch as anybody else does. It's really how you talk about that that is different. But you yeah. know, so it's not that you can't, under particular circumstances, talk about dependent and independent variables because you have directly manipulated those. Uh, you uh, looked at it in various ways. You move something around in this field of interaction, and that reconstructs the whole field, mm-hmm. reorganizes the field of factors that are participating, and so you see something else. It's just something that wasn't there before, some behavior that wasn't there, et cetera. Mm-hmm. It's really a matter of um, uh, of conceptualizing th- not only psychological events, but all events as occurring in a field of interaction, an integrated okay. field. And you're focusing on some particular relation in that field Mm-hmm. Uh, as a psychologist, you're focusing on something else. If you're a sociologist, focusing on something else. If you're a physicist, but mm-hmm. what you're studying are these are these uh, relationships uh, that are not causal relationships. What caused the whole field? What was the physical causes bigger, or stronger than the biological ones, or the psychological mm-hmm. causes? They beat those. And I think the concept of causality is sort of ruins the whole uh, potential for um, adequate interdisciplinary understandings. Mm. Um, so the cause part, we just, that's the what, how we've come to talk about these relations. 
-hmm. But causality itself is not a, an observable feature of, uh, of the world. Mm. That's the name we give when we see a relationship between things. But there's no, you can't point to something and say that that thing has causal power. What, what do we mean causal power? Mm -hmm. I, don't, I just don't think that helps. Okay. So. And, and could you, I'm also hearing you say that it's problematic in terms of, of working with humans, potentially, like, you know, in, in an RFT sense and, and contextual behavioral psychology sense or, or, or ABA sense, whatever you want well, to say. Speak I to. think, you know, working with human beings um, and uh, well, let's put it this way, human interactions, of course, are exceedingly complex. Um, they're complex because there's a, a history that is not, not known or not known enough. Uh, uh, and that history is present as you go forward. Uh, and it's uh, substitutional. It's complex. It's, uh, uh, there are all kinds of things going on that you don't know about. It's not like studying a, um, a behavior of a rat in a chamber. Mm -hmm. A rat has a very limited um, uh, contextual uh, history. It's always in this chamber or the home chamber, this chamber, the home chamber. Not much is going on. There's no other organisms there. Uh, there's uh, The animal doesn't have language, and so its repertoire is really rather uh, dependent on the actual physical objects that are present in the situation. Mm -hmm. So studying animals in small boxes where there's nothing else going on but food deprivation and eating, that's a simpler situation. A human situation is far more complicated than that. Mm -hmm. And because it's more, if you think about a human situation in the context of, of uh, therapy, where you don't have control over the circumstances of that person's life. You know, you don't know whether they're telling you the truth or not. You know, not, you don't know whether they're saying what happened or not. Uh, you don't know what their history is. And there are complex interactions going on there. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to be real, feel really confident that what you're doing is... Um, um, you know, doing that what you're saying and what's going on is really what's happening here. You don't really know what's happening mm -hmm. uh, as best you can. So it doesn't feel precise as you were saying. Okay. But so, so then we take human beings into the laboratory and we want to study language. That's extraordinarily complex. You don't really study language in the um, laboratory. Occasionally, somebody looks at what one person talking to another person, and that you try to, you know, write it all down and code it this way and that way. But we're always missing something. And more usually, we're not even doing that. We're having one person, you know, do a match to sample situation, mm -hmm. and even a new listener, you know. It's not an exchange. Yeah, it's a partial. It's a. It's looking at a partial aspect of human interaction, um, uh, with with only certain measures of it. You know, we shrink it down to something that we can look at, and that's the way science goes. We have to shrink things down, but we shouldn't imagine that <laughs> that. That solves all the problems of human behavior. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Because so what I'm what I'm inferring from what you're saying is it could be problematic to be kind of tunnel visioned on what's causing this behavior if we're if we're stuck if we're if if our if our lens is the Skinnerian lens. Yeah. There's no one cause of complex human behavior. Okay. <laughs> or. <laughs> Even if you want to believe in causal relations, what are you going to say? How many causes are there to this particular event? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And and does does um, some of what you're talking about now get at um, the equivalences process and the, the 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 observer versus the event perspective? Uh, yeah. What was happening at that time? And that was I don't know. Ninety two. 
92. Okay, what ha- was happening at that time uh, in the field was um, that, it, you know, equivalence and framing, relational frame theory, and everybody was talking about equivalence, and it was interesting, and, you know, um, it was kind of things happening without learning and all mm-hmm. of that. Uh, and But it was a sort of outcome related. So uh, somebody would do an experiment and then the outcome would be um, a, a, def- a demonstration of equivalence among mm-hmm. factors. Um, but the, it was kind of just being described as sort of an um, emergent thing, came from nowhere, it was almost magically you got mm-hmm. this thing. And, I, and so it, uh, that equivalence as process paper was what I was trying to say, well, yes, we're getting these outcomes. And p- frankly, we know what outcomes we're going to get before we even do these studies. I've already done a few. Um, but how, how does it happen? What is happening? And what I was trying to suggest is that the match the sample arrangement was um, a circumstance in which substitute stimulation was happening. And so this became like that, and that became like this, and this had the, uh, you know, the substitutional functions of something else. So in the end, of course, you responded to it, but I think there was a, an idea in there that what you're responding to is kind of reflexive relations in the sense that substitute, uh, the substitute uh, stimulus functions were from another object, but it was attempting to describe what might be going on so that in during that process uh, so that we would see so that we would get the outcomes that we were expecting and getting okay could could you could you say kind of talk about that what what is the observer perspective versus the event perspective uh, yeah generally speaking and I'm not sure if that was the angle I was taking then we are engaged in in some behavior with respect to our environment. Mm-hmm. Those are the events that an observer, an experimenter, is trying to describe. Mm-hmm. The description of those events is not the same as the events themselves. Right? Yeah. So the description of there's, the events themselves are what they are. But the yeah. problem is, how do we communicate that to somebody else? Well, we have language and we communicate it by words. We say this happened, then that happened, then that happened. And sometimes we confuse our description with the actual events. Mm -hmm. So on the basis of a description, so our description of a relationship of behavior environment is that the the stimulus caused the response. Mm -hmm. There's the description, right? Um, So then... Uh, so then our investigation is focused on how did it cause the response? You know, what was the nature of the causality? How powerful was it? Was there another cause? Are the causes and responses reciprocal? It's all based on some description, but the description itself is about something that wasn't in the event. Mm. So if there's no causality in the event, we, we end up, describing something and then following up on our description. Yeah. So we describe uh, something as uh, being instinctual. Mm -hmm. And then we want to go into the body and find out where instincts are located. Mm. You know, it's that kind of thing. We, all I was doing is trying to point out the fact that the events and their descriptions are different and we can get screwed up if we don't keep that in mind. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) We, we, we are, we're, uh, we're likely to get screwed up in a lot of ways, no matter how we go, it seems as humans. Yeah. <laughs> and we're, we're attempting to do very complicated things as both, at, we're doing very complicated things as, as players, as, uh, as, uh, uh, people, mm-hmm. uh, and even more complex talking about what we're doing. Yeah. What what is your estimate in terms of how many decades it's going to be before some of the issues that you've been raising in the last few years are are in the history books and in, in, in terms of behavioral sciences? <laughs> I don't know. Um, you know, when I was a, uh, a graduate student, I I met with Cantor, wrote mm-hmm. several times. Uh, I asked him that question because 
who was even studying his work. <laughs> and he he was a very, uh, I mean, he was in his 90s when I was meeting with him. Okay. He, he, um, he was very articulate and everything. And he kind of laughed when I asked that question. He said, oh, I think about 50 years. So... <laughs> So it hasn't been quite that long, <laughs> but it's but at least what I've been saying, it, it was it was uh, kind of critical of Skinner at first, and then it was talking about interbehaviorism that nobody knew anything about, and furthermore didn't want to hear anything about, and <laughs> it was, you know, and some of it was published in kind of books and places where you couldn't get it, and it was mm -hmm. hard to publish in journals because, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but I think there's more of an interest now. Um, seems like there's an interest um, with the um, contextual behavior science group, at least. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the radical behaviorism group's not interested. <laughs> um, I don't know. And the, and the that your the, the radical behavioral group you're referring to is outside of uh, ACBS. Yeah, I'm talking about the sort of hardcore Skinnerians. Okay, 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 yeah. Huh, okay. So you're you're thinking at least another fifty years. <laughs> I hope not. I hope not. <laughs> but, what is that? That word "inner behaviorism" is a is a, a kind of a confusing word to me to hear. What is um, what does that mean? Yeah. It it um, well, you know, what is the subject matter of psychology? Okay, it's behavior. Mm -hmm. Well, for Cantor, that's not the subject matter. The subject matter is the unitary relation of behavior and environment. So, which is one thing, not two. So, the environment can't cause the the stimulus can't cause the response because it's part of the very thing that is a unit. Okay. So, the interbehaviorism was a way of um, distinguishing the position from behaviorism by suggesting that it was the interaction of stimuli and responses that okay. he was talking about as the unit of analysis. Okay. I think that's where it comes okay. from. Okay. So inter, interaction behaviorism. So it's, yeah, but it just became interbehavior. Okay. I wanted to ask a question about functions over objects and verbal stimuli. The functions over over the objects. Yeah. Well, here's a physical object, a pen. Mm -hmm. right? uh, it's a physical object. It has various properties. It's slender. You can grab onto it, whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. Those are all actions that can be made with respect to the properties of this object. But, uh, but another, uh, I could uh, respond uh, not just in terms of its physical properties. I could call it a pen. I could say it's a black pen. I could say it doesn't work very well. I could say the ink is too runny. You know, I can say various other things about it. Those are uh, that the pen is stimulating, responding of that sort too. So what we can say is that what I do with respect to this object is not the same thing every day. Mm -hmm. You know, it's different things like, write with it, I call it a stupid pen, I throw it in the garbage, you know, I, I you know, I, I prop something up with it, you know, I, I can very, do various things with respect to this pen. And what that's saying is that the, the interaction of responding with respect, the, the interaction of the organism with this object, physical object, is more complicated. The object has stimulus properties that interact with response features that's the interaction. It's between the functions of this object, which are which vary given the context, mm -hmm. and the responses that I make with respect to this object. And so there's a, a stimulus. Um, one stimulus can stimulate multiple responses, and uh, um, the same response can occur with respect to multiple stimuli. So the, the object is not part of the analysis. It's a source of stimulation. And there may be many functions uh, uh, inherent, inhering in this source, given yeah. your history, and they vary given the contextual circumstances. Could we think of a thought similar to that pen? 
Well, a that, thought is behaving, I would it's say. Behaving. Yeah. Okay. So treating uh, that as an object. Thinking is behaving. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, thinking is. Um, see, I don't like the private public uh, dichotomy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I think thinking is behaving. It is. Uh, it's, it's behaving with respect to environing circumstances. I don't think it occurs in your brain. I think it occurs in the same field of interaction as everything else you do. It's mm -hmm. uh, subtle. It's uh, transient. Um, it's uh, unique. You know, it has all these features that make and. and um, uh, and and it's obvious that we don't uh, can't make observational contact with it as readily as we can with somebody walking down the street. Mm -hmm. But I think that's a matter of shared history. So I think uh, observation we have a standard for observation. Two people have to see it. Tinder doesn't care about that so much, but somebody has to be able to report on it. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, we have to do high you and blah, blah, blah. We have to do all of these things to assure that we observe something. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a one shot. Looked at it. It happened. I marked that down as one event. I looked yeah. at it again, marked that down as another. I count them and everything. Um, but in the case of thinking, um, you know, you have to explain how is it that I know what my daughter is thinking. But I don't know what that 29-year-old girl over there is thinking. Mm -hmm. And it's not because I can't observe thinking. It's because observing with respect to my daughter, I've seen how she responds to things overtly. Mm -hmm. I've seen how she. I, I've seen how she. She doesn't overtly respond to something that, on another occasion, on another context, she would respond to something yeah. that might be problematic. Mm -hmm. uh, I know what stimuli substitute for stimuli, other stimuli for her, because I've sh I have a shared and long history with her. Yeah. So, to some extent, I can say I know what she's thinking when nobody else could. See, she's she's not engaging in any overt behavior, and the 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 stimulus that she's responding to is not present. It's a substitute stimulus. It's not an object that is mm -hmm. presently in the room. It's the function of something that is adhering in something else because of conditions of association. And, and what's problematic about you seeing her thinking as something that's happening in her brain? Oh, I don't think it's happening in her brain. I think it's happening. Well, I know, but I'm saying what's problematic about that? Like, because you're, I guess what I'm hearing from you no. is you don't like that. You, you, no, no. You don't, you well, know. I mean, psychological events don't occur on the part of parts of the body from a psychological standpoint. I think it's always the whole organism who's interacting, not, not the lungs or the heart or the, you know, brain or the, you know, you don't walk with your legs alone and you don't think with your brain. It's always a whole organism that you're talking about. And furthermore, if you think thinking is going on inside, which is what Skinner proposed with the public-private distinction, mm -hmm. what did that mean for studying those things? The physiology of the future is going to figure it all out. Mm -hmm. You know, 70 years later, physiology of the future hasn't spoken up yet. Maybe so the aliens, when the aliens land. We've abandoned the analysis of these things. Because I'm sorry, I talked over you. What did you say there? We've abandoned the analysis yeah. of uh, in so-called internal events because, yeah. one, we think they're going on inside, and so therefore we don't have access to them. But if we imagine that the whole organism is responding with respect to the environment, there's no skin boundary. You know, some things don't happen inside the skin and some at the surface of the skin. It's mm -hmm. kind of an odd way of thinking. It's the whole organism. Yeah. And we just have to take a different view of observing. Some observing of subtle events may require multiple observations of a person over time. But it's not unobservable. Okay. I, that's the way I think.
Yeah. But you see yeah. old people where they finish each other's sentences. Uh -huh. you know, they both stand up at the same time and go do something without even saying anything to one another. That's history, shared history, mm -hmm. as a as a opportunity for observing subtle events. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a point that I'm I'm really interested in, and I think that it's it's one that's hard to outgrow that that mentalistic perspective, just because it's how we yeah, it's always it. pooping up on us. Yeah, <laughs> it's part of our language and yeah. the, part of our you know thousand year history of thinking about these things. So, would you would you be privy to ask your daughter what are you thinking? Is that the question that you might ask her? Oh, sure, sure. So, okay, um, so it doesn't change how you investigate no. no no i mean i could i could ask her what 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 are what are you thinking yeah. and um and she might tell me and she might not <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but um but, but that wouldn't change anything that would uh i mean i might as i have described know what she's thinking Mm -hmm. And I might ask her if she's thinking as a kind of check on what I think I know. Mm -hmm. okay. But um, if I don't know what she's thinking, which, uh, you know, the longer and more intimate your history, the more you know what somebody's thinking. Mm -hmm. So if I didn't have a long and intimate history with her, I wouldn't know what she was thinking any more yeah. than I know what that stranger 29-year-old girl mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but we ask each other what we're thinking all the time. And yeah. It's because it's subtle, it's fleeting, it's unique, it's transient, you know, it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, it's um, not, it, it, it's not obvious. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I'm, I, the more that I trudge down this path of the understanding behavior of behavior relations and appreciating that and agreeing with it philosophically, uh, I, I also want to kind of, I'm still trying to wrap my head and heart around pragmatically how it's useful. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's always that question and it's one of the sort of abiding critiques of, uh, interbehaviorism and interbehavioral psychology, um, that what, what difference does it make? <laughs> Whatever, <laughs> what? what? What difference does it make? I mean, okay. what do you yeah. this part now? Yeah. Uh, what's what's it? It does have any utility. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that I believe about science is um, that it has different subdomains. Okay? It has a investigative domain, has an applied domain, mm -hmm. it has a theoretical domain, and it has an underlying ph philosophical foundation. Mm -hmm. And I think for a science to progress. Um, to be both productive and progressive, uh, there has to be some alignment of uh, those subdomains. Yeah. I mean, you can't be talking about the mind in application and in theory saying there is no mind. I mean, in other words, the, the science will uh, build upon itself better if there's, a, if there's some coherence in, in how things are talked about. And there's different things talked about in each of those subdomains. But the, the way that they are, these domains are kind of held together is by a set of definitions of terms, a set of assumptions about the origin of certain features and how they go together and, you know, in other words, there's some philosophical assumptions, and they're not something you put to an empirical test. And all, all sciences have philosophical foundations. Some people don't necessarily know about them or care about them. Um, but when they don't, when people don't pay attention to that, it's very likely that the more complex the event they're looking at, the more incoherent they're going to be. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, so what a philosophy does is say, okay, this is the this is our subject matter. It's behavior, environment, relations, uh, interrelations occurring in a field of other factors. You know, it describes what it is. It describes its sort of the origin and how, what is the past? What is the present? What is the future? How do we look at those things? How do we look at time, space, etc.? Without that, uh, 
a science is likely to become inconsistent and incoherent. Mm -hmm. And that means that it's not going to progress or be as productive as it might be if everybody's talking about something else. Mm -hmm. So I think the philosophy of science, philosophy of psychology, uh, is, is, it is an, an important thing to systematize that, to see what it is we do believe in, what are our assumptions about yeah. um, uh, uh, our subject matter that we can, we can follow. It's not like those will stay that way forever. Yeah. I mean, we'll find that, um, you know, there is no um, you know, drive or there is no instinct or there, you know, we, we, it, it's not that it, it's not that it never changes, but because it's about such things of such broad scope, mm -hmm. it doesn't change as rapidly as a you know, theory about equivalence, mm -hmm. you know, so it's a foundation. And so its utility is in sustaining the science in a, in a manner of, that it can go forward, uh, uh, well, productively. Yeah. So, you know, and you don't need as many philosophers in a science as you need investigators and mm -hmm. don't need as many investigators as you need practitioners um, or theoreticians. But mm -hmm. um, to ignore systemization at that level is, um, uh, that's not useful. <laughs> I put it that way. Yeah. You're you're a keeper of the flame, kind of, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, <sorry. laughs> yeah, yeah, and I, I really appreciate that that uh, um, fortitude and uh, um, well, we all the mind of yours, yeah, for our day. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that leads me to the question of of you know the 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 work that you did and you know the the seminal work that I see as as. That you are you're one of the officiants in the in the marriage of contextual behavioral psychologies and functional contextualism. Like that 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 union there, that 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 those that those technologies were 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 grounded in functional contextualism has a lot to do with the work that you did in your career. Um yeah, maybe there's some canter in um, contextual behavior science. Yes. Yeah. Is there is there anything else that, that you think is important for folks to know about, you know, the, this, this foundational work in, in behaviorism or, or folks who are, are coming to this way of thinking, uh, like I, I've kind of termed non-congenital behaviorists, uh, you know, um, in terms of understanding, like where this came from. You know, uh, Cantor's work is, um, you know, he's written, I don't know, 15 books and gazillion papers or whatever. Uh, but he is, uh, his writing, people have uh, said, is it's hard to read. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I, I think probably I thought that too when I first read it, uh, because it's dense and um, a lot of big words. And, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, but I think, now... I think some, some people might have said the same about some of your articles too. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> I must have picked it up from him. <laughs> but uh, uh, but now I find uh, in reading anything of his um, interesting, and it is, it, it's very easy for me to read one because uh, I know it. Yeah. Uh, but also because it's very systematic, and you know I've been of course studying everything Skinner ever wrote, and Skinner is not a very systematic writer. You know he'll. He'll say um, he'll say something, and then you think, "Oh, that's what he means about uh, self knowledge." And then he says in the next sentence, "Well, that's not what we believe in self knowledge." You know what I mean? It's kind of like what, what? Um, I, I know Skinner's work very well, mm -hmm. but I'm just saying uh, from a systems perspective, okay. Cantor is more systematic, and but it's difficult, and so I get people. And the books are getting harder and harder to find and uh, to purchase. And some of them you can get, and they're pretty cheap, you know. But um, you know, it's, it's running out of running out of it. And so there needs to be. I'd like to be able to capture 
what he has written that people get get access to okay. uh, for the future, even if they don't read it now. I'd like to maintain some you know, archive that is seems to be slipping away. Um, well, I can't remember why I was even talking about this. Um, I would like people to have access to it. That's one. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but most people, in addition to it not being readily consumed, um, people always ask, well, where do I start? How do I, what, what should I read first? And uh, it's really hard to say what to read first, you know. Uh, some things are definitely not to be read first because they extend into, um, you know, history, they extend into uh, other um, philosophers of science that people may not be aware of, including me. Um, and so therefore I would, uh, my, um, my uh, colleague Mitch Freiling and I are writing a, an introduction kind of to interbehaviorism oh, uh, that nice. was, it's based on Cantor's work, of course, and but we're trying to um, trying to have it be a place where people could start and then from there it might be okay. easier to read some other things nice so. yeah uh look when is when is that uh do to hit the the bookshelves uh well uh not uh we thought it might be available by um uh the fall but it's going to be delayed okay uh, COVID made it kind of hard to. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's going to be delayed. Uh, it'll probably come out maybe. I don't know for sure, but okay. we're working on it constantly. And <laughs> okay. Cool. Uh, well, I look forward to to that, and um, and I'll I'll add that to a link so that uh, to this show once it comes out, so people can can access it. Uh, to the show notes. All right. Well, thanks so much for for um, sharing your wisdom with me today. And uh, Ooh, fun. Very very grateful. Thank you. But I'm getting stronger. They take a piece of me. But I'm getting stronger. They take a piece of me, but I'm getting stronger. They take a piece of me, but I'm getting